Welcome again to another exciting episode of Reflections. And today we're going to delve into part two of our discussions with Jairo Guzman, who is president of the Mexican Coalition for Empowerment of Youth and Families, which we delved into a little bit the last time. But before I go into that, I'd like to extend my thanks and appreciation to the staff and um, members of the Morris Heights Health Center here at the Walton location for affording me the privilege of using their time, equipment, and space to bring this broadcast to you. So I want to um, thank again Morris Heights Health Center here in the Bronx, who are also doing your mind's work. So um, welcome, Jairo. And uh, thanks for taking the time out again to come and um, enlighten us on some of the things that your organization is doing for the wider community. Um, the last time we began to speak about uh, some of the programs that you offered, some of the, um, the issues that the community faces in terms of translations, in terms of uh, language barriers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I don't know, would you want to expand on that for the start uh, to tell us a little bit more about, tell, yeah, about what your organization offers and uh, what it is trying to achieve? Well, again, thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for inviting me once more to, to come and share about myself and the Mexican coalition. It's, it, it truly is a privilege for me to be able to come on and be able to speak about what gives me great pride and, and, and makes me very, very happy to be part of. Um, you know, as we were speaking before, you know, part of the work that we're doing with Mexican coalition here in the Bronx, particularly in the South Bronx, is to serve our community. And that includes people from across the globe, right? And in the South Bronx, as you likely know, there's a great number uh, of, new, um, of new immigrants uh, from Africa uh, while there's still others who are who've been here quite a while from the Mexican, um, you know, from the Mexican community, the Dominican community, the Puerto Rican, and uh, in Central and South American, and those are the people that we're seeing in 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 our organization. And again, as you mentioned, some of the language barriers uh, that are very much uh, present when it comes to reaching these communities and trying to serve them uh, as best as can as one can. Right, uh, and and that includes making sure that we are working with people who, you know, that we have a team of persons who are able to reach the community members that we need to reach, uh, including some of the languages that uh, they speak. All right, so that being able to be of service requires for us to be able to recognize how we may come from the same country, but we speak different languages, we have different traditions. You know, the same thing with uh, Central American folks. You know. Uh, the Bronx has a high, high concentration of Honduran people who speak Carifuna. And, and, and who speaks, sorry? Could you? The, the Honduran community. That speaks what? Who speak Carifuna. Garifuna. Garifuna. Yeah, Garifuna is an, is a, an indigenous language okay. uh, in Honduras. And there's a high number of persons from Honduras in the Bronx. It has actually has the highest concentration of Honduran people of New York City. Of the five boroughs, the Bronx has the highest number of, of Hondurans. Right. Okay. Uh, but uh, Garifuna is spoken in like parts of Nicaragua and... That's, that's right. In the northern part of Nicaragua right. and, and of course uh, Honduras uh, being the main, the main. country that has the most right. um, of persons who speak Garifuna. Okay. Yeah. There aren't that many Nicaraguans in, in the city of New York. Uh, okay. It's about 20, 20 to 25,000 Nicaraguans. So it's a small number, though a number that cannot be neglected, right? Well, okay. Um, a quick question, um, Jairo. Do you find that um, immigrants, in spite of where they're from, uh, their background, their ethnicity, I don't like to use the word race because I, I don't think it's a scientific term and I don't, you know, I don't subscribe to it. But um, do you think that immigrants have generally the same basic types of problems? So if, where if I'm from, I'm from Caribbean, I'm from Central America, South America, Argentina, 
um, the Philippines, my problems are generally the same as somebody from Mexico. You know, overall, I think we all want the same things, right? Especially the same thing for our families. You know, I have children, I have two boys. I want the same thing for them that other immigrants do, right? Quality education, quality health care, good opportunities to get to be employed, uh, good, good opportunities to go and get higher education, not just grammar in middle school and high school, but actually to have a chance to go to a good university, uh, to have decent uh, housing. So we don't want different things. I think we definitely confront things differently in great part because of some of these challenges and in great part because uh, some of the structures that exist in, in a city like New York uh, keep some in and some out. And, and that's a reality that we have to confront and, and address and work together to, to make it better for everybody else. But as you mentioned, the truth is that we want the same things. The challenges vary a bit in, in that we speak different languages. We have different traditions and therefore different interpretations to the opportunities that exist. We come with baggage, right? You know, in Mexico, it's a country known for corruption. So it's going to be more challenging for Mexicans to trust that the local government here is going to respond. For those persons who come from countries where this a greater uh, amount of police brutality, well, there's going to be bringing that here and have be even more resistant with regard to accepting that the police is here to help. So there are a number of things that we bring in, therefore, present additional barriers to making, um, to, you know, to acclimating ourselves and becoming part of the greater society of New York and, and of the United States. Can I ask you something, Jairo? <laughs> I heard a professor um, from Stanford Business School speaking recently, and um, countries such as Mexico or um, other countries in Latin America are labeled as corrupt. But, but this professor was making a point that, for example, lobbying in the United States, um, which is a, a part of the system, is, is, is she was making a point that um, that is, uh, that it in itself in essence is corruption but it's just that it's legalized and um it's it's, it's you know given a, a cloak of decency um so we have to be cautious as to how we see some of these countries are corrupt what, what what would be your response to that i would i would agree i would agree definitely i mean we are you know Countries like Mexico, countries uh, like those in Central America or South America confront different problems, different challenges. And they're more open to accepting that some of these challenges may force some to cut corners that they really shouldn't. But the reality is the United States does a lot. You know, exactly. You know, they, the, the one thing that they've done, and I think the difference here, um, the corruption that I've encountered in the United States in New York City, having been privileged to work in different uh, places. In, in other parts of the world, I think corruption is seen immediately tied to money. There's a direct and short distance to the money. Here in New York, I, my experience has been that corruption exists directly connected to power. People want to be in a position of power. People want to be in a position of saying, I'm the authority and I make things happen. And that corrupts people. Uh, and ultimately systems that are supposed to care for people become broken because of that kind of, um, well, because of that kind of corruption, uh, you know, that kind of thing that allows for someone to think that they can have the power to control others. Okay. Um, and, and that's and, and my experience has been that that's the kind of thing that I see here, that kind of corruption. Okay. Now, Jairo, uh, time is always against us, but I'd like to go into a little bit of the programs that um, the coalition offers. You uh, list preventative health programs, adult education programs, legal assistance clinics, trainings for consular personnel, international business incubator for immigrant women. Um, you offer a wide variety of services. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. 
Well, again, yeah. you know, when I came out of, um, you know, I used to work at an agency for um, here in the Bronx that was trying to help the Central American community, particularly the Garifuna community. And then I went to work for the Mexican government, the Puebla government, to try to help people in Pasig. And basically, you know, something that is not well known is that the people from Puebla, citizens of Puebla, 40% of the citizens of Puebla in the state of Puebla can't prove they're Mexican. All right. they so are there's being, no birth certificate or no, no birth certificate. document, permanent document that ties them to? That's the, correct. Okay. So Legal. for many... Oh. So, so for many Mexicans, when they're here from the state of Puebla, they're doubly right. undocumented. They have no way of proving they're Mexican and no way to prove that they belong in the United States. They're so how does your organization help them? So my organization works to make sure that we begin to establish identity, that we work very closely with the Mexican consulate, as well as with the Mexican government in Mexico to make sure that we get the documents that these people need. That was my whole work in Pasaic where, where I helped where I helped the Mexican, the Puebla government to establish a community center, Mi Casa es Puebla, right? I work very closely with uh, the Mexican community in Pasaic to open a, a, to establish a business association. You know, Tell us a little bit about that, expand on that for us. You know, in this country, mm -hmm. immigration is such that if I'm undocumented, and I and, and let me tell you, I, I mentioned in the previous episode that I came, my mother brought my, brought us here on undocumented, right, irregularly, mm -hmm. and uh, and if it wasn't for the amnesty in 1986, I would still be undocumented. Mm -hmm. So I have a keen understanding and sensitivity to some of the challenges that some of our people face, and when it comes to the United States immigration, you're not allowed to work legally if you are if you don't have work authorization but you're legally able to open a business. I don't have to be a US citizen. I don't have to have a green card to open a business. How so is you, that done? How is that done? Because you can uh, you can acquire um, an identification um, number to pay your taxes, an ID. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and with that, you're able to open a company okay. and be able to uh, establish this Trade. business and begin to earn money. Okay. And so you wind up having a lot of businesses Mm -hmm. uh, some of these businesses pretty large. I know a person in Pasaic who owns a fleet of trucks to distribute Mexican products. This man is is moving at, at least two million dollars worth of produce on a monthly basis, and he's undocumented. Wow, that's fine. amazing. And he's he's hired people who are legally able to work here. Right. Yet the Smart owner, <laughs> yet the owner of the company is undocumented. Well, right. and and wrong. and we have many. But, persons. And then uh, Hiro, he's able. He should be able to. I, I believe I'm not a lawyer, but I believe that there is a way. If you have a company who was generating a certain amount of assets and employing a certain, amount, there is a, possibly an avenue that you can um, develop a residence, right? Uh, they, they, uh, you know, like you, I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, uh, mm -hmm. but my experience has been that, yes, there is an avenue for a person who's able to put down, you know, I think somewhere around $5 million or so right. to open a business and that kind of stuff. But again, um, from what I understand from lawyers is that it can't be done from here. You have you actually need to be outside, outside of the country, of country. to be okay. able to, uh, to make that kind of transition into becoming legal. So for many of these businesses, mm -hmm. many business owners are actually prisoners uh, of their success also. Mm -hmm. you know, they've established well-run businesses, um, but they're not able to establish a legal status. Their immigration mm -hmm. status cannot be adjusted. Mm -hmm. And so they're stuck. They're not able to go back to their country and, mm -hmm. and that's not just uh, of the Mexican community. That is an experience across the board for many immigrants who have been extremely All over the world. Correct. All over the world. Yeah. But and, and here in New York, you know, many, many very smart immigrants have been able to open a business. Okay. You know, and have this kind of status. They're a regular status and they are able to, you know, they're hiring thousands, thousands of other immigrants and other U.S. citizens to work for them. However, they're not able to become citizens. Okay. Um, now, I'd like you to just tell us a little bit about your uh, business incubator for immigrant women. Because well, women 
form the backbone of families and communities. Absolutely. And again, here is uh, uh, the same situation. Many of the women that we are working with are in a, 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 you know, they have an irregular immigration status. And so they need an opportunity for them to begin to support their families. Many of them are single parents. You know, uh, New York City is fabulous at disappearing husbands, right? Uh, so many of these women are forced to not only raise their children, but also make sure that they're feeding them, they're clothing them, they're, and they're providing shelter. Right? And so they, they, they have no option but to begin to open their business and they become micro entrepreneurs. And many of these women do not know that that's what they are, that they are entrepreneurs. So we have met women from Mexico, from, from Central America, from South America who are selling, you know, dresses Isis. that they import. They're selling braces, they're selling tamales. Ices. Uh, yes, yes. Ices. They, ices, uh, flowers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mangoes, it, it, fruits. And, and you know, let me tell you, there's a lady in, in Brooklyn who is undocumented and she has five, five tamal stands, okay? She's selling tamales, you know, at least a thousand tamales a day, okay? She's hired people. And you know, if you speak to this person, she's extremely humble. She was so very shocked to learn that she was an entrepreneur, that right. she was managing large quantities of money buying and having to make you know keep a ledger of what's being uh what's coming in what's going out and so so, so our entrepreneur is helping these women who come from across the world primarily latin america to be perfectly honest with you uh and giving and give them the tools they need help them help them understand how the system could work here to their favor with regard to you know learning the basics of how to manage their money how to how to be able to know you know how much to buy in order to for them to produce how much to pay themselves many of them also feel ashamed to pay themselves first right and so it's important for us to be able to provide them the tools that they need in order for them to continue to be successful more than they already are Okay. So, and I think that recognition of them being entrepreneurs is extremely important because so many of them don't realize that that's who they are. Okay. Now, Jairo, uh, um, as usual, time is against, but you brought along some pictures which we like to share with our viewers, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about them. Absolutely. Um, so this one is... Um, I mean, this, this picture is actually from Sunset Park. You know, we are doing a lot of work with COVID we're doing a lot of work around preventing the spread of COVID. And so we have staff that's been trained by the Department of Health of New York City to provide testing. And so here we have two staff members who are on the sidewalk in Sunset Park where there is a large concentration of Mexicans and Guatemalans right. uh, be tested uh, and helping them understand that testing for COVID is part of prevention, it's part of okay. preventing people from being infected. Yep. Next slide. So, you know, you know, for us, making sure that we're reaching the people that we need to reach means that we have to work with people who look like us, who, you know, people who look like me, my color, who have the same accent. Think and like you, have the same values as you, et yes. cetera, et cetera. And so here is a picture of uh, Dr. Uh, Solomon um, Angulo. He's an MD from Mexico. And he is giving a class to a group of ladies who become our health promoters. And these are all volunteers who've come and they actually get trained for 110 hours. They come to be trained on preventive health. And, and this class is taking place at Fordham University where we are allowed to use their uh, rooms to be able to uh, do these type of trainings. But we've done in the City College, we've done at Columbia University, different universities where we're able to have their professors and their facility houses to be able to do this kind of training and have them. And what the does this person. enable them to do? Well, this enables them to be the persons who go out into their neighborhoods, into their building, and be able to share with their their friends and their neighbors what are some of the key things that they need to prevent some of the most common diseases. So diabetes, obesity, okay. cardiovascular illnesses, respiratory illnesses. They're the ones who get information from us we get it from the department of health from different hospitals and then we impart it to them and they're the ones who fan out into the into the city and you know the five boroughs because okay. the, 
these classes are are for people who come from across the city okay. and they're the ones who are out and about doing uh delivering the news with regard to what's working what's not working and what are the news around health excellent next slide you know uh um New York City, we work very hard, and we, the advocate community, the, the, the social service agencies and the advocate world, work extremely hard to make sure that everyone has access to health. Okay. Health care should be a right for everyone. Okay. And so and New York City has come along and has actually created a program, NYC Care. And so NYC Care is an access to health program where we are helping persons connect to exactly that primary care. So no matter what your status is, your immigration status is, you have a right to have health care. And this and NYC care, we have persons, we have staff who are trained to be able to help connect these people to that service. So they're able to have uh, access to a primary physician at any New York City hospital or any of the 70 clinics that belong to HHSC. You know, helping us operation. Excellent. You know, we do, you know, I'm a trained uh, mental health first aid uh, trainer, and therefore we deliver these sessions across the city as well, where we want persons to have the skills and the knowledge in order for them to be able to provide assistance to someone who might be experiencing an emotional breakdown. Okay. You know, right now, the next pandemic, we're worried about COVID. The next pandemic is mental health. Okay. So next many slide. people are suffering, and that's the solution here. Okay. Here uh, is another person. We have a young lady, Luisa, who is actually training persons on their eyesight health. You know, so we want for people to know that they need to care for their sight. And so we're actually training them uh, for them to understand the relationship between diabetes and, and vision and how they can take care of their uh, visual health. And here's the team. You know, I have the I, I have the easiest job in the world. I get the opportunity to come and speak to you, Patrick, and, and to some of you audience. But the people who actually do the work are those folks. You know, they're the ones who are out in the street getting out. They're the ones who are pulling together boxes and packets and bags. They're the ones doing the testing and making all the phone calls to all the neighbors that we're trying to help. So this is a picture of our team, our staff. Okay. Know, interesting you know as i mentioned to you we are helping um, many immigrants fix problems that are actually rooted back home in their native country and this is the church at a at a place called uh then um no um Tlatenco. it's a san antonio Tlatenco. it's a town in mexico in the state of puebla okay and we're actually helping these people get birth certificates Actually, I should be traveling to Mexico in December to actually hand deliver 36 birth certificates to Mexicans that I mentioned don't have uh, a way to prove that they're Mexican, even though they were born there. Oh, yeah. interesting. Interesting. Is there not? OK, this slide. Yeah, this slide. This picture is a picture of our volunteers. These they're pulling together informational packets about and we are producing anywhere between a thousand to two thousand of these packets per week with inf with masks. The city, uh, the Department of Health and uh, Health and Hospitals Corporation give us uh, masks for us to put together and the information on how to prevent COVID, how to connect to a um, NYC care and other services. And so our volunteers are that then get distributed in the neighborhoods that we visit. There another slide. Okay. Here is recognizing the many volunteers that make the work that we do possible. Yep. So we have many volunteers who are new, some who have been for many years. Uh, and again, uh, and, and let me tell you, many of these uh, volunteers are persons who don't have an immigration status. And so, but they want to be part of the solution. They want to help their neighbors. And so they freely come uh, to our office and spend hours doing the work uh, you know, putting together packets, teaching us to do our work better. Okay. Amazing. You know, I mentioned that, ben you know, we work extremely close with the Mexican consulate. Ventanilla de Salud is actually a program that the Mexican government funds 
in order for us, the Mexican uh, coalition, to connect Mexican nationals to healthcare in New York City and all the social services across the city. So it's a good program. So La Ventanilla de Salud, and, and this is our staff members doing this kind of work. Okay. Food pantry here in the Bronx uh, on a bi-weekly basis on Fridays, we give families of them a food that we get from New Where's York. Where's this, um, Jairo? This, this is at our office on 50th Street and Melrose Avenue. We're at Immaculate Conception Church where we rent an office and they, oh, give okay. us, they allow us to use the We give 80 bags, uh, we give uh, to 80 families on a bi-weekly uh, basis food. We get this from New York Presbyterian uh, hospital and um, and West Side Community uh, Coalition Against Hunger. They're the ones who provide us the food and we can distribute it. We do the same thing in Sunset Park, also okay. where we do this kind of pantries. Well, I just like you to take exactly a minute, Hiro, to wrap up for me. I know you. This is such a fantastic um, uh, display of uh, service, and I want to. Thank you. I just wanted to ask if you had uh, just a few words, to the viewers, as to um your thoughts on what about today well again you know again I, I as i said in your earlier in the earlier episode and now again it has been a privilege for myself an immigrant who came here on document and was able to adjust my status to be of service and we offer as you're uh, you know as you've already highlighted through the pictures our nyc care our cover prevention work you know we were encouraging people to participate in all of us. We medicine is being made for the white person. We want medicine to be made for people who look like me, brown, black. You know, we want for them to be engaged. We so, so, so how do people find you? We have 30 seconds to wrap up. Where, where you, find you? you know, as I mentioned, we're on 150th Street in Melrose at Immaculate Conception Church. Okay. You know, people can also call us. Our phone number is 646. Uh, 917 600, um, sorry, 917-600-1644 is what we're at. And folks can certainly uh, give us a call or send us a text and we will be ready to serve anyone who's able to come to our office. And a lot of it is now being done over, um, you know, over the internet. So no longer do they have to come to our office. Okay, okay. Well, splendid interview. And um, thank you so much, Hiro. Um, uh, for a splendid, wonderful, insightful, and informative interview, and um, wish you a lot of success in your endeavors. Thank, thank you. you uh, thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you for your audience who being who for being so generous with their time. Uh, again, thank you very much. COVID-19 has changed how we spend weekends with the girls. Now it's time to take the first step that lets us get back to brunching instead of late night munching. Before we can safely come together, we need the facts. As COVID-19 vaccines become available, you may have questions. Should I get it? Is it safe? Should I wait? It's okay to have questions. Now get the facts at GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision when vaccines are available to you.